So today, friends, I want to talk to us about faithfulness. I want you to think of the word faithfulness. What do you think of when you hear that? Over the next few weeks, my plan is to spend some time on this concept of faithfulness and look at it in, in how it pertains to various areas of our lives because we all are involved in so many different facets of living on planet earth, but faithfulness is something that is godly. God is faithful. And when we understand what faithfulness looks like in our own lives, we are a reflection of that to the world, a greater reflection of what God is like on planet earth. Because man inherently struggles to be faithful. Your, the, the selfishness of humanity is actually the antithesis of faithfulness. Fullness. The Message Bible says in Lamentations 3, 22 to 24, it says God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. They are created new every morning. How great your faithfulness I'm sticking with God. I'll say it over again. He's all I've got left. Friends, at a time like this, where all of us have been ravaged in some way by the scourge of this coronavirus, our liberties threatened or even assaulted, our nation itself is in turmoil. People have, be, have got so sick and some people, loved ones, have even passed away. We're experiencing a form of economic hardship that is, having to, that is making us be incredibly more flexible than we've ever had to be before if we want to survive. Imagine if all you've got is your strength to rely on. Imagine if all you've got is your little job to hold on to. Imagine if all you've got is the money you've got in the bank. Imagine if that's what you've got right now. How tragically sad. What a vulnerable place to be found. But I say to you, child of God, you have his steadfast love. You have his faithfulness. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithfulness. Psalm 85 says that steadfast love has come from heaven and faithfulness has sprung from the ground and in Jesus they have connected. Peace and righteousness have kissed and for those who find themselves within that kiss, within that embrace of steadfast love and faithfulness, it is the safest place to be always, every time, without exception. I want to say, church, feast on His faithfulness. I have an appointment with God every morning where I feast on His faithfulness. I will not skip that time. There are times when I've had to, but it is my intention to never skip because I get to feast on His faithfulness. I will focus. I will eat it. I will drink it. I will let it wash over me. It renews and restores my soul. Do you know the Greek word? which is the language of the New Testament, for the word faithfulness is the word pistis. It essentially has two basic meanings for us. Number one, a sure, steady constancy. Sure, steady constancy. Not changing. Once it's committed, it's committed. It doesn't change or vacillate. Or someone who can be relied upon. Completely. Once they've said it, it's going to happen. Faithful people do not waver when their expectations aren't met. A lot of people waver when their expectations aren't met. All you've got to do is look at marriage. My expectations aren't met. Waver. Now, faithful people don't waver when their expectations aren't met. Faithful people don't chop and change based upon what options suddenly become available to them? Faithful people stay the course. 
When they say yes, they follow through every time. True faithfulness stays the course, finishes the race, despite challenging times, despite changing times, despite vacillating feelings, faithfulness stays the course. Faithfulness flows from what the inner heart decides, not what the eye sees or what the soul feels. I'm going to say that again. Faithfulness flows from what the inner heart decides, not what the eye sees and not what the soul feels. Philip Yancey said it like this, faithfulness is believing in advance what only makes sense in reverse. Now the book of Ruth is what I want to focus on today. It is a delightful read in the scriptures. It's short and it's sweet and it's powerful. A Jewish family comprising of a husband and a wife, namely Elimelech and Naomi, together with their two sons, Malon and Chilion, they leave Judah because of a famine. And they venture into Moab, a foreign land, hoping for better prospects. Life's got to be better there because it's terrible here, so let's go and experience life there. It was a time in the history of Judah and Moab where they weren't at war because they had a few wars between them. But sadly, further disaster, besides a famine, strikes Naomi because her husband dies while she's in Moab. Now it's just her and her two sons living among strangers in a foreign land and a foreign culture with nothing that you're familiar with. And your husband's gone, you're a widow. So her sons seek out Moabite wives and they find their wives and they get married. And for about 10 years, life goes on. She's a widow. Her sons are married. Just when life couldn't get much harder, this poor widow experiences radical tragedy in that both of her sons now die. She's lost her husband. She's now lost her two sons. She's in a foreign place, foreign culture. She's got nothing left but these two daughter-in-laws. It's a disaster. Imagine that's where you found yourself. Amazingly, throughout this book of Ruth, God doesn't speak directly. That feels like some of us sometimes in our experience. Like, God, I need you to speak now. God doesn't speak directly throughout this whole book. But Naomi is a faithful woman. I want to show you today what happens when you're faithful. Interestingly, what we find as we read the book of Ruth is that even when there's famine and there's loss and God is seemingly silent, God is still orchestrating things behind the scenes in and through faithfulness. God is passionate about rewarding faithfulness. He really is. From verse 8 to 13, Naomi basically says to her two daughters-in-law, listen guys, or I pray, listen girls, <laughs> listen girls, don't feel like you're stuck with me. I want to set you free. It's probably better that you go back to your homes, you go back to your families, you go back to your culture, you go back to what you're familiar with because I've got nothing to offer you. I'm a widow, I'm poor, I've got no wealth, I've got no future, I've got nothing, so please, my daughters, go home. What a beautiful heart. She wants the best for her daughter-in-laws. You try putting that advert on your Facebook or Instagram feed. I've got nothing. I've got no hope, no future, no wealth. People are going to run away. They're not coming towards you. That's what Naomi puts out there. I've got nothing. Go. Now here's a little pearl 
and I want you to listen. Right before you ever make a decision for faithfulness or faithlessness, there will be a decision presented to you, and the question is, what will you see? Right before you, because faithfulness and faithlessness, the opposites are decisions that you make. But when that decision comes, there is an opportunity to see. And the question is, what do you see? This is what happens. Naomi considers her life and the future of her daughters-in-law. And she says, listen girls, get out of here. Leave me alone. I'll be fine. Go and find yourselves husbands. I've got no more sons. I, I can offer you nothing. And then there's this beautiful encounter where as they, they kissed each other, the daughters kissed Naomi, they wept. And both the daughters, both of them said, no, we will stay with you. Both of them, Orpah and Ruth. No, we will stay. Naomi could have taken that and run. But you know what she does? She says, girls, no wait. Just in case you're acting on emotion here, let me remind you, I have nothing. I can offer you nothing. No future. Nothing. You know what the next verse says? At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. There was a decision that was made. The one, they both first said, yes, we'll stay. And a moment later, one kisses them goodbye. It's what I call faithlessness. The one who said, no, I will stay. And even upon the reestablishment that there's no future, she says, I will cling to you. That's faithfulness. And I want to show you what happens. Because each of those decisions produces a fruit. And you're going to see a historical account of what the result is of faithfulness and faithlessness. And it's quite astounding. What sounded like faithfulness from Orpah wasn't. Actions do speak more powerfully than words. Presence is more powerful than an empty promise. To understand the context, Orpah and Ruth are believed to have been daughters of a Moabite king. They, they, they had wealth in their homes. Going back to their homeland would have been the best and easiest. It would have been the easy way out. It would have been the path of least resistance. Faithlessness will always present itself in a way that makes sense in the moment. It presents itself in a way that this is the easiest way out of here. This is the best for me right now. Interestingly, at crunch time under pressure, Orpa buckles, changes her mind on staying, backtracks, decides to go home instead. Seemingly a logical and easy decision. There she probably thought, I can marry again. I can enjoy the luxury of my household. I can be familiar. I, I can have a future. I can have children. This is going to be amazing. You know what Orpa's name means? The name Orpa means nape of the neck. It can also allude to being something with a, a, a stiff neck. Having one's head drop in shame or submission or stubbornness. The drooping of one's neck. Concerning the nape of the neck, think about it like this. It could imply turning away and showing the nape of your neck. Faithlessness. Ruth's name means compassionate, friend, a vision of beauty. Compassionate, friend, a vision of beauty. Orpah leaves, Ruth stays. Orpah shows the nape of her neck, 
Ruth, a vision of beauty, a friend, compassionate. So Ruth and Naomi travel back to Judah. She says this incredible, incredible statement that most people who have heard of the Bible or read the Bible at some stage would have heard this before. Where, she says this, where you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die and be buried. Only death could part us. It is the epitome. It is the essence of faithfulness. There is nothing that will change my mind. Nothing will separate me from you. I am with you always, even unto the end. Sounds like the promise of God to us. That's Ruth 1, 16 to 17. Ruth has a heart of faithfulness and a heart of faithfulness will see the fruit of faithfulness. There's a sentence that you should commit to memory. A heart of faithfulness will see the fruit of faithfulness. Just like a heart of faithlessness will taste the fruit of faithlessness. So, Back in Judah, they start all over again. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi. Now Ruth's the daughter-in-law. Naomi's the mom, the mom-in-law. Ruth says to Naomi in chapter 2, verse 2, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. They've got nothing. They've got nothing to eat. She says, let me go and find somebody who won't chase me off the field and who allows me just to pick up the little bits of grain when they're threshing and they're harvesting and little bits fall off. I'll gather that and we'll have something to eat. Even, friends, in the absence of God speaking and with no clear spirit leading, the faithful heart arises and goes to do what faithfulness does. Absence of God directing it. It wasn't like she had a dream from God, go here, go to this place. No, just, I will, I'm going to go and try and find something. That's what a faithful heart does. Ruth is willing to pick up leftovers. She's not tainted by culture. She's not filled with pride. She's, she's simply looking and willing to take any opportunity and believe that just maybe something good can come from this. She saw something that no one else could see, a vision of beauty even where there were ashes. What others saw as scraps, she saw as supply. What others saw as leftovers, she saw as provision. A vision of beauty. She was able to see something beautiful, even in the ashes. Verse 3. As it turned out, the Bible says, as it turned out, She was working in a field belonging to Boaz. Friends, we all need as it turns out moments. Now, if you think an as it turns out moment, is this a coincidence? It's not. It is a passionate God who responds to faithfulness. A God who rewards faithfulness. In our culture, understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that we do not earn favor with God. We do not earn acceptance with God. We do not earn love with God. But you reap rewards for sowing in the Spirit. Fact. As it turns out, she works in the field of Boaz. Friends, this is evidence of God working in the background, orchestrating something of a blessing for the faithful. For Ruth, what seemed to be a dead-end road of lack was actually going to turn out to be an on-ramp onto a highway of provision. That's what God can do. Ruth 2.11, Boaz replied to her, I've been told about what you've done. That's what he says to her. I've been told 
Because there was talk. Who's this woman here? Who's this woman here? And they started to talk about it. And she's the one who went with, she came back from Moab with Naomi. Da, 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 da. She left her culture. She left just to support the widow, her mom-in-law. She says, I've been told about you. What's your testimony, friends? Because that was Ruth's testimony. I've been told about you. I've heard of your faithfulness. And because of that, he says, you can come and you can, you can glean as much as you like. Boaz even started to offer her more. By the way, talking about faithfulness, do you know that Mother Teresa once said this? God has not called you to be successful. He's called you to be faithful. C.S. Lewis, another great mind, said it like this. It's not your business to succeed, but to do right. When you have done so, the rest lies with God. Matthew 25, 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done, good and talented servant. Not well done, good and successful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Luke 16, verse 10. Jesus said, whoever is faithful with little will be entrusted with much. Friends, we want to learn the power of faithfulness. Faithfulness isn't being lazy. Verse 15, Ruth got up to go and glean. Listen to what Boaz says. When he saw her gleaning, so she got up to go and glean. When he saw her gleaning, he gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Not at the back. Let her come right in where you are and nobody say anything bad to her because of her testimony of faithfulness. He says, even pull out some of the stalks from your own bundles and drop them on the ground for her to pick up. Take from your best and give it to her. Friends, this woman modeled faith in action. When she got up, Boaz commanded. If you just stay passive, if you just stay lying there feeling sorry for yourself, ain't no Boaz going to command people to help. God works orchestrating things in the background. Not coincidence, but he rewards faithfulness. There are two types of seed. Yeah, let me go there. Two types of seed, friends. Seeds that are sown. One's the seed of faithfulness. One's the seed of faithlessness. Both seeds will produce a crop, guaranteed. Faithlessness will produce fruit. Faithfulness will produce fruit. But the crops are remarkably different. They are radically different. I'm going to show you from Scripture now. I'm building you up to something here. Faithlessness sprouts up quickly and it can seem like immediate gain. It can seem like the best thing that you've done, faithlessness. Like, wow, yes, this is it. Let's go for it. But the Spirit of God inside of you, deep down inside, you'll know it's not actually what he was leaning towards. Faithfulness takes sometimes a bit more time and faithfulness demands a little bit more perseverance but its fruit is phenomenally better. Ruth planted a seed of faithfulness when she clung to her mother-in-law and she was about to reap. Chapter 4 verse verse 13 of the book of Ruth. So Boaz took Ruth And she became his wife. Here is a woman who sometime before had nothing left. Could have gone back to her own. Chose to come with a mom-in-law. She ends up becoming the wife of a prolific and powerful man in Judah. A man of wealth and compassion and a godly man. Somehow God connected them Together, the start of the fruit of faithfulness. And it tastes good. 
Ruth couldn't believe how awesome this was. Verse 16. I'm oh, sorry, let me go back to verse 13. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son, the fruit of faithfulness. Then Naomi, remember who Naomi is, the mom-in-law. Then Naomi took the child, her grandchild, in her arms. And she cared for him, being a good granny. And the woman of the neighborhood gave him a name. And they called him, sorry, gave him a name saying, Naomi, the forgotten widow, now has a son. And they named him Obed, the fruit of faithfulness. Obed is the grandfather, or, 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 no, let me say it like this rather. Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. And when you go to Matthew chapter 1 and you read the lineage of Jesus, from Boaz and Ruth comes Obed, comes Jesse, comes David, comes Jesus. It's a fruit of faithfulness, friends. Jesus is the fruit of that woman's faithfulness. What a harvest. The greatest thing that your faithfulness produces or accomplishes may be something that you never yourself personally get to experience. What Ruth did with her mom-in-law when she clung to her and said, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my, be my God. Nothing will separate me. The, the greatest fruit of her faithfulness was something she never saw, but she's in the Scriptures. And Jesus comes from that. Orpah tastes the fruit of faithlessness. Does that mean she had a horrible, poor, miserable life? She never got married. She didn't have food. No, no, no. She had all of that. She got married. She had wealth. She had food. And the rabbinic writings say she had four sons. Ish Bibinob. It's an amazing name, that. I had to practice that two times before I said it to you. Ish Bibinob. Saf. Lami, and, wait for it, Goliath. That's what the rabbinic writings say. Goliath, the giant, who David ends up slaying. What fruit do you want to eat, friends? Faithfulness or faithlessness? The fruit of faithfulness will ultimately overcome the fruit of faithlessness. Faithfulness can look like leftovers, but it gives birth to blessing. Faithlessness looks like an immediate gain, but gives birth to giants who need to be slain. Friends, we can face giants in our times, like right now. We, we can face a lot of the fruit of faithfulness. And I want to say what overcomes always is faithfulness. Your God is faithful to you. He is seeking a people who will be faithful. Faithful to Him. Faithful to the call of God upon their lives. Faithful to being a witness to Christ. Faithful to prayer. This is a time, church, to pray for this nation. Every day I urge you, pray, believe in God for grace and mercy and favor, for a better South Africa, better for all, not just better for you, better for all, better for the poor, better for the unemployed, better for race relations, better for South Africa. Be faithful in prayer and be faithful in community, friends. The church's future throughout the history of the ages has never been built upon this, the, the massive big celebration of thousands or several hundreds, it's built upon the pockets of community who are faithful, 
who love each other, encourage each other, pray for each other, and support each other. Friends, let the fruit of faithfulness abound. Yeah.